everybody. It's uh, Michael Fox, um, the regional coordinator for um, the Webaquay Supply Road uh, project. Uh, we have Don Parkinson with us here, the um, Indigenous um, Engagement Specialist uh, and um, main presenter for uh, a lot of these cases. These uh, Welcome, Don. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to today's session with mm -hmm. uh, the community. So um, just for people's background, um, um, why we're um, offering uh, these sessions uh, on a weekly basis is because um, we have a list of communities that are potentially affected by the Web Equate Supply Road project. So as part of the terms of reference, which is a work plan for the province uh, for the environmental uh, assessment, um, the, the approved terms of reference um, had ter uh, terms and conditions. And part of those terms and conditions was to do three rounds of engagement uh, specific for each of the communities that we have to deal with. So this summer, spring, summer, we're doing that first round uh, for each of the communities and, and um, uh, offering um, you know, a variety of types of information in this round and then it'll be different for the second round and then for the third round. So the, the, the approved tour means that the environmental assessment has started uh, and uh, all the um, field studies and people studies, uh, indigenous knowledge studies, like that, that's all uh, in, um, has begun. Uh, and uh, it will be continuing for the next um, at least couple of years uh, before we get a draft report. So, so here's round one. Uh, we're with the Bamatoon First Nations, and then I'll um, give the floor over to Don. Thank you, Michael. And uh, as as Michael mentioned earlier, this is the first round of the uh, environmental assessment phase. So what we're going to do now is is uh, play a presentation. It's been pre-recorded, and the presentation uh, goes over the project, describes the project, and talks about what we've been doing, what we've been hearing from uh, communities. And then after the presentation, we are going to have a, a brief discussion of any issues that have been raised by Yamatung and um, and then open it up to uh, questions and comments. So we look forward to hearing comments from uh, from your community. So uh, without further ado, let's let's play the presentation and then we'll come back and talk with all of you very shortly. Welcome to the Webaquay Web Supply Road Environmental Assessment Phase Round 1 presentation. Today we are going to talk about the environmental assessment steps, what we have learned from communities, the importance of Indigenous knowledge, road route alternatives, and what happens next. For background, Webaquay First Nation is about 250 kilometers from the Hudson Bay and James Bay coasts and the road runs south of Webaquay and then east to the Ring of Fire area. The purpose of the Webaquay Supply Road is to move people and supplies to the Ring of Fire area, create jobs and business opportunities for community members, as well as skills training opportunities for young people. This would be done in a way that will preserve and strengthen the community's language and culture. The road will be 107 kilometers long, with 17 kilometers of the length actually within Webaquay First Nation reserve lands. The corridor planning area is two kilometers, but the actual cleared area will be 35 meters. The road will make three large water crossings, one across Winisk Lake and the other two across rivers. And the project will also include temporary pits and quarries, equipment storage areas, and construction camps. Now we are going to talk about the environmental and impact assessment processes. There are two environmental assessments actually going on. There's an, an Ontario or provincial one and a Canada or federal one. Webaquay is also doing their own internal assessment of the project. At the end, one report is created for review by Ontario and Canada. There is coordination between the federal and provincial EA processes at different points in the process. One body of documentation though, one report, one body of, of documentation will be produced 
to address requirements of both the terms of reference, which is the provincial work plan for the EA, and what we call the tailored impact statement guidelines, which is basically the work plan from the federal side. Now we are going to talk about the communication we have had with Indigenous communities. When we were developing the work plan for the environmental assessment, also known as the terms of reference for the provincial environmental assessment process, we created a project website. We sent notices to communities, did virtual and in-person community meetings, and made project information available in many ways, such as through the website or by mail. And we've also accommodated during COVID by switching a lot of our in-person meetings to virtual meetings. We have received comments on the environmental assessment terms of reference or environmental assessment work plan from many First Nations and First Nation organizations. These comments are wide ranging. They talk about many, many different topics. Some of the topics are, are focused on Aboriginal and treaty rights and interests. There's cumulative effects and the need for regional assessment. So looking at the broader effects of the project and looking at the project from a much sort of higher level in combination with other projects that are either planned or exist in the area. There, uh, we heard comments on protocol, so ways of communicating with communities and the, the consultation process. We heard comments on environmental assessment or impact assessment, the actual undertaking of that work. And then we also received comments on uh, participation in capacity funding, providing resources to communities so that they have the capacity to be able to review documents and, and conduct their own, for example, Indigenous knowledge studies. There were other comments on ownership and maintenance or operations of the road. There were comments on socioeconomic impacts of the project. There were a number of comments on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, as well as water or water quality and wildlife and plants had many comments as well. So there were comments from a lot of communities, a lot of First Nation organizations and about many different subjects. Let's, let's move now to talk a bit about the study plans. There are many studies involved in an environmental assessment. The technical team had to prepare detailed plans explaining to the federal government how these studies will be done. So this, these are very detailed sort of recipes as to how, how the work will be undertaken um, at, a, at, a, at a very technical level. And these were reviewed by the federal government by experts in the federal government. So there were a number of different technical study plans prepared and these in, the subjects include geology, terrain and soils, surface and groundwater, air quality and climate change, noise and acoustic, vegetation, wildlife, fish and fish habitat, species at risk, socioeconomics, human health, visual environment, and cumulative effects. Our team also prepared fact sheets to summarize. Now we will talk about how an environmental assessment is done. There are many steps involved in an environmental assessment. One of the steps is to identify what we call valued components. Valued components are the environmental, health, social, economic, or additional elements or conditions of the natural and human environment that may be affected by the project and 
are important to community members, are of concern or value to the public. Indigenous peoples, federal, provincial authorities, and interested party. They are what people are concerned about. Then we have indicators. Indicators represent the resource, feature, or issue related to a valued component, so what's, what's important to community members. And if these indicators are changed, they may demonstrate an effect on the environment. A better way probably to describe them is, is, a, is a way of measuring potential effects. And it's used in the assessment and evaluation of alternative routes and the overall effects of the project. Now let's talk a bit about assessment boundaries. For each thing that community members think is important to study in an environmental assessment, a valued component, a study area needs to be defined. These are different depending on the valued component, and that's a very important thing to remember. So there are three general study areas, what we call the project area or project footprint. Then we have one kilometer on either side of the road center, which is called the local study area, and the regional study area, which is five kilometers on each side of the center line of the road. Those are the general study areas. And this next map shows the three basic types of study areas relative to the, the two alternatives, the community-based alternative and the technically preferred alternative, which looks at the community-based alternative and makes minor changes to the route based on better terrain and soils and, and other factors. Let's now talk about the study areas for valued components more specifically. The study areas for valued components or things that are important to community members are determined by many different things, including what community members are saying, indigenous knowledge, indigenous land and resource use, and Aboriginal and treaty rights. Now we're going to move to talk a little bit about baseline studies. Think of baseline studies as a way of finding out the way things are now, so what we call existing conditions. And if we know that, we have something to compare to when looking at possible impacts of the project. So it's a snapshot, a picture of the way things are before the project. There are many studies that are done as part of an environmental assessment. These studies look at three general areas, the natural or what we call biophysical, socioeconomic, and cultural. They're all under these categories. For example, let's look at natural or biophysical. Within that, we would have studies on vegetation, such as the peatlands or wetlands and forests wildlife, fish and fish habitat, species at risk, air quality and climate change, noise and vibration, visual environment, surface water, groundwater, and geology terrain and soils. So there are many studies on the natural or biophysical, in the bi natural or biophysical category. Now, if we look at the socioeconomic infrastructure and social services, then we might look at human health. We could, might look at land and resource use or indigenous knowledge and land and resource use. Then we look at another major category of studies, which is archeological resources or built heritage or cultural heritage landscapes. So there are many groups of studies. And even within the studies that I mentioned, there are more studies that are done, more specific studies. For example, if we were to look at caribou, there are a number of different types of caribou studies that are done as part of, as part of an environmental assessment or an impact assessment. Let's now 
look at select valued components as examples. And uh, this will hopefully uh, help everyone sort of better understand what I've just been talking about. So let's look at study areas for, for uh, wildlife. Um, the general or local study area um, would be a one kilometer buffer, as I mentioned before, from the center line of the alternatives. 500 kilometers from what we call supportive infrastructure. So these are things other than the road that are required as part of the construction or operation of the project. These might be camps or aggregate or rock source areas or access roads. And then the regional study area, general regional study area, extends five kilometers on either side of the local study area boundaries. If we look at moose, for example, that has a different local study area. In that case, it's 10 kilometers from the center line of the alternatives, 500 meters from supportive infrastructure, but the regional study area extends 50 kilometers from either side of the local study area boundaries. Then we look at caribou. Caribou have an 11 kilometer buffer from the center line of the two alternatives and from the same distance from in support of infrastructure camps. So it has a bigger uh, distance around it to define the local study area. And then the regional study area for caribou is in, in includes entire ranges of caribou, which is very, these are very, very large areas. Next, and finally for wildlife, let's look at wolverine. Wolverine has an 11 kilometer buffer from the center line of the alternatives and from the supportive infrastructure, and it extends 50 kilometers from either side of the local study area boundaries. Let's have a look now what that means in terms of maps. So these next few maps will illustrate the different types of study areas I just discussed. So this first one is the general study areas that I was talking about. The next slide shows the different local and regional study areas for moose. And then after that, we have the wildlife study areas for wolverine. So as you can tell, you can see the 50 kilometer buffer around there, much larger area. And then finally, the largest study area you can see here, you can see the local study area on the actual map, and then the, the regional study area, which includes two ranges uh, for caribou, and that is in the upper right corner. So it's a much larger area. So let's talk a little bit about wildlife again, and some of the, the criteria or valued components associated with wildlife, just to give, just to give you an idea of, of uh, and a better understanding through examples. So for wildlife, you might have forest birds, you might have raptors, you might have shorebirds or waterfowl or bog and fen birds like muskeg birds and other wetland birds. Uh, you might have bats or fur-bearing animals like lynx or rabbits, you, ungulates, which are, which are moose, for example, um, amphibians and reptiles, and then pollinating insects, insects as well. So the indicators or the ways of measuring those could be, for example, changes to habitat availability, the quantity of habitat available. Is that impacted by the road? could be changes to abundance, meaning actual numbers, or the distribution, the spatial distribution, where these animals are over the land or water. Could be changes in the species richness. When we talk about that, we mean the diversity of species, the number of different species. Could be changes to survival and reproduction. Could be changes to To, the, to predator access, habitat use, and population, or it could be change, changes in wildlife mortality or due to stress from, from... So let's talk a little bit about the baseline studies for birds. 
spring and fall aerial water bird surveys were conducted in 2019 and 2020. And uh, some of the things that we found were that the large lakes, and this isn't that surprising, were staging areas for waterfowl. Smaller lakes and rivers aren't really used that much by migrating waterfowl. We also conducted breeding bird surveys in 2020 and 2021. And we had, we did listening counts at 263 stations. And uh, we also uh, used things called acoustic recording units in at many different locations, actually 89 different locations in to listen to the sounds uh, in these areas. The next slide shows some pictures that were taken from our breeding bird survey field work. We also conducted baseline studies on bats to look basically for how many species are present. So we looked at, as I mentioned, bat diversity or number of species, and we used uh, listening, listening devices, what we call ultrasonic recorders. And we, we, serve, we did surveys at 10 different locations. We found five species of bat, including the little brown bat, which is endangered in Ontario. We conducted a number of baseline studies on caribou as well. Caribou aerial surveys were conducted in 2018, 2019, and 2021. These are aerial surveys where we, we have biologists uh, looking down and counting the number of caribou and identifying male, female, and making other observations about other large mammals. We also conducted in 2020 a caribou calving study, both by foot and by helicopter. We conducted a caribou collaring study in 2021, and that helped us identify um, calving areas, areas where community members, or community members, where caribou would, would uh, have their young uh, winter areas and, and, and identify travel corridors by being able to track the individual caribou uh, across the landscape. And so far, the data has shown that most collared caribou are of the what we call the eastern migratory population that that winters in wooded areas, but actually has their young along the Hudson Bay shoreline. Next are a few pictures of of some of our uh, from some of our caribou aerial surveys, and then the slide after that shows photos from our our collaring study as well. So let's talk a little bit next about baseline studies for wolverine and amphibians. We conducted, a starting in, in 2021, uh, a wolverine occupancy study. And so we set up sampling stations called run poles that at 25 different sites within 10 kilometers of, of the, the planned road center line. And then these, so these stations were set up to, to include um, uh, what we call snag posts to collect hair from the animals that would visit. And then there were wildlife cameras set up. From this work, not only did we get boundary of, of Wolverine in Ontario, and uh, so it, we've gotten some really interesting results from that. We also did some amphibian studies where we sampled um, uh, for calling frogs by using these aco acoustic recording units that we had set up for breeding bird studies. And uh, this allowed for evening surveys to be, to be done in these remote uh, muskeg or wetland areas that we wouldn't be able to get access to uh, otherwise. So next, let's let's move on to talk a little bit about, about indigenous knowledge. A big part of an environmental assessment is indigenous knowledge. We have with the Webequay Supply Road project an indigenous knowledge program. We need communities to share their indigenous knowledge with the technical team to help us identify potential project effects. This helps us avoid or reduce potential effects 
on indigenous rights and interests. As part of doing this work, we take the indigenous knowledge that we are able to collect. We make sure that it is kept confidential uh, to whatever degree the community, community would like us to. And then we, we combine this information with the Western science information to very comprehensively identify impacts of the project. We want to work together with your community to collect important Indigenous knowledge. As I mentioned, we will respect the need for confidentiality. We have communicated with communities about the need to collect Indigenous knowledge for the project. And we've also invited communities to participate in our Indigenous knowledge program. So again, this is a very, very important part of this environmental and impact assessment, collecting Indigenous knowledge. And we really would like to encourage communities to, to provide that input to us so we can make sure that we've assessed impacts of the project very, very thoroughly. Let's move now to talk a bit about consideration and evaluation of alternatives. We have different root alternatives that have been developed by working with community members. Of the two alternatives, one is the, what we call the community preferred route, and the other is based on where the best land for road building is. So it's sort of the technically preferred route. We're also looking at different locations for sources of, of road building material, such as gravel and rock. This next map shows the two alternatives. In yellow is the community preferred route, which was derived by Webequay First Nation members meeting over a fairly long period of time to discuss the best possible route for the road. And then the green line represents technically preferred version of that route, looking at the best areas to travel through in terms of, of, of best terrain to build in generally and other factors as well. Each alternative does get evaluated in detail and there are many factors involved in that evaluation, such as natural environment, indigenous knowledge, land and resource use and interest, socioeconomic and cultural heritage, and, and of course the technical side, cost, constructability, and safety. And the purpose of the evaluation of these routes and aggregate rock, aggregate or rock sources is to identify a preferred route and, loc and preferred locations for, for sources for aggregate and rock that, that has the least potential for bad effects, for negative effects, and the greatest opportunity uh, for controlling those, those negative or bad effects and offers the community the greatest benefit as well. The evaluation of alternatives also considers, considers other facilities that are part of building the road such as temporary access roads to get to those gravel pits and quarries, for example, to get to the lay down and storage yards, uh, uh, construction camps, as well as bridges. Let's talk a little bit about consultation approach and next steps. We will be talking to communities in the next few months. We have three rounds of consultation planned as part of the environmental assessment phase of the project. This presentation is for round one. But as you can see in this slide, we have the two other rounds, round two coming up hopefully in fall of 2022, and, and in winter or spring of 2023, the final round, round three. This round talks about the overall IA process, it talks about the IK program, it, it talks about criteria and indicators, uh, the evaluation of alternatives. The next round, round two, will summarize the input that we got, identify alternatives, identify preferred routes for the road and aggregate or rock source, source areas, and provide, and provide some preliminary engineering design elements. And then finally, round three will be a summary of round two, what we found in round two, and a summary of preliminary effects, early effects based on our analysis of, of the project and proposed ways of managing project impacts or mitigating impacts, limiting or controlling impacts, and then talking about follow-up monitoring 
either you know uh, during construction or post construction. There are no, we will be collecting your feedback on the project in many ways, including community meetings, interviews, open houses, live streaming sessions, the project website, and social media. There are many different ways available to to collect feedback from your community and we we welcome input from you in terms of how you would like to communicate with us in terms of next steps let me just talk about where we are here now we are looking for input to finalize the criteria and indicators as well as identify study areas for the valued components we're looking to continue with our baseline studies and collect indigenous knowledge now in fall of 2022 we're looking for input to evaluation of alternatives and selection of the preferred route and locations for the construction material sources aggregate and rock and we'll be doing the preliminary engineering design of the road then in winter of 2023 we'll be getting input to preliminary effects assessment of the project and input to proposed impact management mitigation and follow-up monitoring and then finally in the summer and fall of 2023 there would be a review of the draft and final environmental assessment report or impact statement the document that goes to both the provincial and federal governments we want to hear from you please provide us with your comments through the project website which is supplyroad.ca. Speak with the project team after the presentation. Fill out a feedback form. We have contact information on the screen for you. We welcome your input. We will respond to you and it will make the environmental assessment and impact assessment better with your input. Thank you for joining us today. Miigwech and we will see you soon. Welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, and now we're at the uh, point in the session where we talk a little bit about what we heard from your community. And um, we have not heard a lot from Yamatung about this project. Um, we did get a comment um, through um, Matawa Tribal Council um, about supporting the creation of a regional uh, technical working group to review the, the EA and, and supplement consultation with each individual uh, uh, First Nation. And um, I guess the, I, my response sort of to that comment is, and, and Mike, feel free to jump in, but what we decided to do, uh, you know, is for this project was to get information out to as broad a group of people as possible, right, you know, from, um, you know, community members right up to leadership. And, and we used a number of techniques, Mike, as you know, um, and continue to for that matter, um, because we felt this was, you know, everyone should know about the technical issue issues. Everyone should know about the, the details of this environmental assessment. So we feel we've done a pretty thorough job through uh, radio shows on the Wabate Radio Network, um, through live streaming sessions, um, basically tutorials uh, about the environmental assessment, whether it's technical uh, field studies uh, or, or discussions on the regulatory processes, including the federal and provincial regulatory processes. So we, we feel that approach has, you know, has, you know, by doing that, we've tried to make this whole process as transparent as possible. And, and really, Mike, we've, we've done, a lot of mail outs and a lot of emails um, out to communities to keep that those lines of communication open, haven't we? Absolutely. I think uh, on a weekly basis, you know, we've been uh, reaching out to um, other communities that maybe that may be potentially affected. And I say and I say that, and I think we all say that because uh, we we don't know until the community tells us. You know how their activities may be affected, uh, how their rights are affected, uh, and their um, their livelihood or, or lifestyle may be affected. Um, if they don't engage, uh, then we don't know, and nothing's on the record for us to develop mitigation measures. So um, that's why our our, our team uh, has been um, reaching out weekly uh, to uh, Ibamatun 
and all the other communities um, with the leadership and um, to um, provide opportunities for, for engagement, right from, as you say, um, virtually one-on-one uh, -on -one with, uh, with the chief or the council. We have a focus group with their staff, uh, with their advisors, or we can have focus group with their communities uh, online uh, and uh, right down to um, sending them a, a presentation uh, uh, through the facts um, and having a conversation over the phone, just like, you know, old school type of stuff and, and um, how business was done before we had internet and uh, stuff was accomplished back then. Um, yeah, so uh, as simple as one hour, one phone, one fax, and uh, we can have a conversation. Uh, that's anybody, leadership or membership from Yvonne Uh And uh, we're very flexible um, in uh, meeting online or on site um, for, uh, for that. You know, the, 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 this regional stuff, you know, um, um, you know, it's, it, you know, this it, it's sort of um, what's been called before the ghost of the regional framework. Somehow, you know, that that framework which failed, um, and uh, we, you know, they just couldn't get consensus. Uh, so um, uh, um, the province is providing individual funding, you know, to many communities to conduct. Um, their, uh, their uh, review of the tour, uh, uh, be part of the EA, as well as um, develop uh, IK. And um, I think that approach is probably mo most effective um, because it would be very specific to that community versus being clumped and maybe being diluted in, in a regional approach on, on, on the EA. I don't know how another community's uh, review of the EA is gonna differ from another review. I think having many different types of reviews uh, will actually be better in my opinion, um, because you'll have different consultants, which we do now. We have different consultants we're dealing with that have different experience, different lenses uh, on, uh, on the effects assessment which is the, the whole purpose of that, of that question. Somehow having a regional uh, uh, assessment process is going to be more enhanced. I'm not sure if that's the case. I mean, uh, you know, the WebEquate Supply Road is probably it's very comprehensive. And the reason why it's comprehensive because uh, it's their homelands. You know, WebEquate wants to ensure has the most rigorous, uh, the most robust, uh, EA and IA for, uh, for this road. Uh, and uh, because many of the, the community's members are, are, um, have shaped, you know, that routing, you know, that's why it's such a squiggly line in the beginning because we were avoiding, you know, uh, cult, uh, sites of cult, uh, Aboriginal cultural significance and, uh, you know, traditional activities, et cetera. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a request that, um, you know, premised on different reasons, you know, that we hear that somehow the collective is better than the individual. Um, I think the individual is the collective, you know, with those that participate uh, and, uh, and engage on this process. Not engaging means that uh, we're not gonna get information that's gonna help with the effects assessment. And uh, I think the law is pretty clear. There's a reciprocal duty to consult uh, when the proponents are outreaching, uh, outreaching and, and, uh, and the Ontario is providing capacity funds. Uh, for that participation, specifically. So. And Mike, you know, we've, we've received many comments from many First Nations, from the community yes. members themselves, from their advisors, their consultants, and those have shaped the terms of reference, for example, because um, we've made many amendments to the terms of reference in the almost, what, 18 months that it, you know, it went through the approval process. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of there was, a, there was a lot of, we received many, many comments and uh, about a broad range of topics as well, too, from the very technical to the less technical. And, and uh, some of them we, re we were able to respond to, some that were provincial responsibility. Um, mm -hmm. But that document, you know, uh, certainly uh, was thoroughly reviewed um, and uh, commented on for sure uh, over that period of time. It was a it was quite a lengthy uh, process, wasn't it? Yeah, 
and we and we welcome. I mean, they, they were very technical comments. Uh, we responded in kind, very specific to the issues that were raised. Uh, and sometimes I think there was a couple of rounds. If I can remember in some of those yes. studies. Yeah. So it wasn't just one round of comments and our responses, but they were they gave more comments based on the responses. And and so we were able to do a couple of rounds with um, with some of the communities. So. It's it, it, it and it was done during COVID, right? yeah. Like it was done during COVID. So I mean, um, you know, a lot we'll get general comments typically from members. Um, there'll be some site-specific ones, you know, based on their land use. Uh, but a lot of the technical conference, and let's be honest with uh, the folks here, uh, it, it's done by the consultants and their technical advisors because they know they know what they're asking for in terms of a scientific basis, environmental basis, uh, and um, and some of the methodologies that we're deploying, you know, of, um, in the areas of concern. So, well, those comments we received too, Mike, they shaped our our consultation efforts too, didn't they? To a large degree. I mean, just for an example, we received comments um, from Meshkigawa Council, and those comments were related to uh, building the road um, through through the James Bay Lowlands, through the Muskeg, and. Um, you know, having heard those comments, and you and I heard those firsthand when we when we visited the the council in in Timmins, um, you know, we that helped shape uh, our approach to to that topic, and uh, to the point where we actually had an animation produced, yeah. didn't we, to help communicate how roads, generally speaking, would be built through that area given all the complications and the challenges that that are faced environmentally yes we yes the assumption was um uh yeah, based on that comment was that somehow we're building foundations you know so like those uh, that's traveled uh, on the highways of northern ontario you'll see the new highways and they're laying down the foundations like they're just piling the foundations you know before they pave it right so the assumption was that somehow we're, we're laying down foundations uh, in the Hudson Bay lowlands and, uh, and be disrupting water flows, you know, surface water flows and subsurface flows. And that's not the case. Um, as we're trying to demonstrate, <clears throat> you know, using this geo grid road, this floating road concept that's been used uh, elsewhere in the country, as well as, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a site in Southern Ontario um, that we'll probably go visit um, to, to uh, get some footage. But this, this geo grid idea that floats on top of the, the muskeg and peat that allows the water flow, you know, to continue. Um, and it's very, that water flow is very imperceptible. It, it, you know, like it's, 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 it's so, it, like when you see it, it's a snapshot, but you don't really see moving water, but it's moving. And uh, we acknowledge that. Yeah, just the nature of the terrain uh, there and so yeah we're hoping to get more uh, animation done more visual aid uh, specific to the road design so people have a better uh, intuition about what you know how these things are designed and what the mitigation measures are associated with that yeah there there's um yeah it, it's really helped us it's really like i think those comments have really helped um identify what community members would like to hear like the topics that are of, that are of great interest such as water for example and as a result you know we've shaped our our presentations and both what we say and how we say it um you know uh it, it's really guided us so that that's another reason why that input is is so important so uh, well it looks like we don't have any questions from uh, community members but um, uh, I just want to remind everyone and uh, that, you know, please uh, contact us. Um, you know, if, like Michael said, if you would like to arrange a meeting in person or virtually, uh, just tell us, you know, what, what you would like and we can, we can figure out a way to make that happen so we can hear from your community. And uh, we're going to keep in contact with you. Um, please, you know, we, we do bi-weekly uh, uh, radio shows and live streams on the Webquay Supply Road project. 
um, this week as well on Wednesday. Uh, we'll be doing that uh, 2.30 to 3.30 on Wabate Radio Network. And then uh, 4.30 to 5, we'll be doing a live stream as well this week. So the topic is uh, water, groundwater and surface water. So we invite you to join us for that as well. So um, any final words, uh, Michael? No. Oh, um, we like doing this every week. And, and um, we'll try to do some direct outreach to, uh, to the leadership of the moment and, and see if they can do some in-person stuff. Um, we're trying to get updates and all the protocols. You know, people are now traveling and, and um, going in and out. So um, uh, every every community is different on that. So we'll, we'll follow up with the bomb tune. So thanks for joining us, uh, everyone. And, and we hope to see you very soon, uh, hopefully in your community. So we'll talk to you soon. Take care, miigwech. 